awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, guys, uh, I'm excited. I thought you sounded great. Uh, I thought you guys sounded great. You know, there's nothing like a Sunday morning singing to God. Come on, man. But, uh, you know, we've done a lot. We've, we've prayed, we've sang, and now we got to get into a Bible study. Yeah. Let's open up to Isaiah chapter 11. And, uh, you know, the, the, I got, I got, I got uh, three rules when uh, we get into a Bible study. Uh, the rules are context, context, context. Wow. We've got to read the Bible in the right context. And so uh, today we're going to get into a topical Bible study. We're going to pick one topic in the Bible and we're going to look at a few scriptures that talk about that topic. Uh, and we'll start right here, Isaiah chapter 11. Now, the context is, the book of Isaiah is written 750 years before Jesus ever comes to earth. Wow. Right? It's written during the time of the country of Israel. And, uh, uh, you know, they have kings who lead the country. And some kings are good, but only a few. Most kings are bad. They lead people away from God. And God's plan to bring his people back is a prophet, a man or a woman of God who preaches to the people God's, uh, God's words and calls them to come back to a relationship with him. And so that's, in a nutshell, the period of the kings. Yeah. One of those prophets is Isaiah. And part of what Isaiah did and what the prophets do is they would talk about what God is going to do in the future. And Isaiah, in this passage, is talking about when Jesus comes to earth, what is he going to be like? Yeah. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Come on, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Wow. Okay. How many of you guys have ever seen a tree stump? You know, like a tree that's been cut down, just a tree stump? Essentially, it's a dead tree. It's gone, it's toast, there's no more hope for it. Oh, no. But because God can take something that's dead and even give it new life, oh, it says that in this tree stump, a little shoot is going to come up, a little sprout, a little leaf. Because even though the tree stump is dead, God is going to give new life to that tree, and it's going to grow. Now, he says that this shoot is going to come from the line of Jesse, from the line of King David. Ooh. Wow, come on. Now, when you study the Bible, you know the great, 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 grandson of King David is Jesus Christ. Come on. So, what, who's going to bring the dead tree stump of God's people back to life? Who's the shoot that's going to grow? It's Jesus Christ and those who would follow him. Come on. Okay, great. Now, what is Jesus going to be like? And Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3, it tells us about the spirit that Jesus is going to have. You know, it says right here in verse 2, it says, Jesus is going to have a spirit of wisdom and understanding. He's going to be wise. He's going to understand many different things. Uh, a spirit of counsel. You know, you ever have that friend? You're like having a hard day. You're feeling a lot of things. And you just go and talk to them and they listen. And then they say one or two things that kind of shifts your perspective. And you feel a whole lot better. And you know what to do? That friend has the gift of counsel. Wow. They counsel you. Counsel. But that's actually what, what Jesus had. And it says here, and of might. Jesus was very mighty. Very forceful, very powerful. It says Jesus will have the spirit of knowledge. Jesus will know a lot. But then... It talks about the spirit of Jesus, and it actually repeats, arguably, the most important quality of Jesus. It says, the end of verse 2, Jesus will have a spirit and the fear of the Lord. Jesus is going to have a fear of God. Yes. Then in verse 3, it actually tells us, not that he has a fear of God. Verse 3 says, Jesus will delight. Wow. Jesus will be happy, wow. excited. He'll be joyful. He'll have delight in the fact that he fears God. Wow. So, title of the lesson. We must have the fear of God. Come on. We must have the, we're going to be like Jesus. We got to have the fear of God. Come on, bro. Come on. Well, what is fear? Because for most of us, 
We think of fear and the first thing that comes to our, we can get scared thinking about fear. Fear, <gasps> you're scared about fear, right? Fear, we typically associate fear with like a negative emotion. Yeah. Like fear's not good. Fear makes me feel bad. Fear is scary. So scary is scary. <laughs> and so we don't think of fear as, some, as something that we have to have or something that we need or something that's important. We usually try and avoid what? Fear. But the Bible says Jesus had fear, fear of God. That he actually delighted and enjoyed the fear of God. So we really got to figure this out. Am I right? There's two definitions of fear. The first is the belief that something or someone is a dangerous threat and likely to cause pain. That's the definition of fear. Someone or something is dangerous and will cause pain. And that feeling, that's when that happens, that's fear, right? Now we know that's a good definition because we've all felt that. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Now, what would be a good example? Of that. So let's say we're sitting here this morning, we've got our heels on, got our church shoes on, and around that corner right there, a nine foot, 300 pound tiger walks in, just licking its chop. <laughs> the, the next thing you hear, all the church shoes as we run away! Because we would see the threat, we would see the danger, and we would feel fear, and we run! I might trip one or two of you, and <laughs> you ain't gotta be the fastest one. The loafers. He can fight the tiger. That's why, guys. Come on. Come on. He'd buy us at least 20 minutes to get out. <laughs> so fear of a threat, fear of danger. That that's fear. Okay. The second definition of fear, it's to show honor or respect, reverence, and awe. So perhaps an example of this second definition of fear, it would be maybe, for example, a, a soldier, perhaps in the United States military, who was wounded or maybe lost a limb. He dove on the grenade, he saved you know, the rest of the unit, and he, he maybe would be here attending service, and, and we'd have a deep respect. We would shake his hand, we'd want to hear his story, and we'd be like, wow. There'd be a reverence of like, thank you. What you did is awesome, right? There'd be respect. You know, the, the one that I, uh, it's hard to explain, but we've all felt it, I think, uh, is the feeling of awe. Mm. Like, wow. Right? You know, I took my date, I took my wife on a date last night. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Awesome. Come on, man. So we went to Rancho's Palos Verdes. The Rancho of Green Sticks. And if you've ever if you've ever been there, it's basically like a beach town in, on a bunch of cliff, on a huge cliff. And so we went to a restaurant, we ate right on the cliff, and uh, the food was good and all that, but but occasionally we were sitting here and we looked to our left, the, the restaurant's on a cliff, and it's just the Pacific Ocean. Wow. wow. And if you ever like taken a second, because we kind of take it for granted living in Southern California, but if you take a second and you just stop and you just like look out, and you're just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, it's huge. Yeah. It's unknown. It's a little scary. Like, what if you got dragged out into the middle of the ocean? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> and you have that feeling of like, <laughs> that's all. That's when you're in awe. You're just like, oh. and it kind of makes you feel like this big. Yeah. You feel humble right yeah. for a second. You're like, dude, there's so much out there. Yeah. It's incredible. That's the feeling of awe. And that's actually what we got to have towards God. Yeah. We got to have both fears. Come on, bro. The fear of God being a danger and a threat and pain. That's actually, we got to view God that way. Wow. And we actually got to fear God in respect, reverence, and awe. Come on. And so today we're going to learn how do we have the fear of God. Does that sound good? Yes, yeah. 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 Sounds good All right, man. guys, we know what fear is. Let's get into it. Turn over here to Proverbs chapter 1. Yeah. Proverbs yeah. chapter 1. And the first point that I have for us this morning, are we wise or are we foolish? Whoa. 
Are we wise or are we foolish? I just dramatic pause while we turn there, you know. <laughs> we gotta like flip our Bibles. All right, Proverbs one one. It says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. The Proverbs are for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, for doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, and let the wise listen. Maybe you already think you're wise. You still gotta listen. And add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Wow. You know, the introduction to the book of Proverbs is it's pretty legendary if you dive around the Bible. And it talks about that the rest of the book of Proverbs, if we were to read it, understand it, and put it into practice, you know, we would gain knowledge, we would gain understanding, we would gain discernment and wisdom and insight. But even though Proverbs is talking about Proverbs, Proverbs is found in the Bible. <laughs> So it's telling us that the whole Bible, all of the words of God, they'll give us wow. knowledge and understanding. We can mm -hmm. avoid foolishness. We can avoid being simple in our thinking. Mm -hmm. But to wow. even start that process, yeah. verse 7 kind of gives us the, the key. It says the fear of the Lord. Wow. That's how you begin. That's how you start. That's how we start yeah. right. wow. getting knowledge. Right. You know, I really was thinking about this, and you know, someone who fears God wants to be in a right, right relationship with God and wants to do things God's way. Yeah. Wow, yeah. And it says that when we start that way, we'll be we'll be gaining knowledge. And I thought about what do we know? since I become a disciple, since we become disciples, what do we know? What is the knowledge that we get? You know, first thought that there's a creator. Mm -hmm. There we go. And it sounds like yeah, duh, Nate, like God made us cool. He made trees, birds, and like human beings cool. Right. But, but, like, understand the alternative. There is no creator. Life started by random chance. So life doesn't mean anything. Life is just lucky. And then we're a little single cell organism. That single cell became a, 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 a tadpole. The tadpole grew legs, became a frog. The frog one day walked on land, became a lizard. The lizard somehow became a, a, a dog, which became a horse, which became a monkey, and the monkey became a human. This happened over billions and trillions of years, and we call this evolution. Wow. Because there is no God, life is random chance and unexplained, unprovable evolution between species. That's actually what the world is trying to convince us. Yeah. Then in the 1800s, some guy, he's actually an economist, not a biologist, he says, hey, in that, there's natural selection. In other words, survival of? See, you all know. See, I'm not crazy. You guys know. So think about it. What does the result of not believing that there's a creator, not, well, not wanting that knowledge? Well, of course, now we can start a war. Now I can kill you. Take your land. Take your money. Kill your culture. What? Well, because it's survival of the fittest, baby. I'm just more evolved. Mm. And so human life becomes next to nothing. Just things to take, things to own, and we don't value the human race. Come on. Wow. So that's, that's one way. Or the other, we're created by God. We're all made in His image. Every single life is important. It has a spirit. It has a soul. Yeah. It's worth saving. People are worth getting to know. Come on, bro. We want to protect and love and care for each other. Yeah. Which knowledge do you want? Because whatever you choose, they, they, the consequences are very far-reaching. Mm. Is there a creator of the universe? And did he make you? Did he make all of us? You know, if there is a creator and he did make us, which there is, then that means he has a purpose. Mm. 
for each and every person and being and animal and, and even the trees have a purpose. Yeah. Right? We breathe out carbon dioxide, and what do the trees do? They give us eye like did the trees have a purpose? So that means you and I are not here on earth for no reason. That our life and our decisions actually matter, actually make a difference. You know, in Jeremiah 29, 11, God just screams out to his creation. I know the plans I have for you. Not to harm you, to give you hope, to give you a future, to prosper you. Seek me with all your hearts. That's what the creator would want for us. Or... We just got lucky that we evolved into human beings with no real purpose. Our life is meaningless in the thousands and thousands of years of creation. And in two generations, you'll be forgotten. <clears throat> what knowledge do you want to believe? What knowledge do you want to put your trust in? The purpose and plan of a creator or random chance? You know, I think about reading the Bible and knowing it. And we actually know the truth of the universe. The truth of the cosmos belongs to us. Wow. It doesn't belong to the president, mm. to the celebrities, yeah. to the professors on this campus. Yeah. It doesn't belong to our parents. We have the truth wow. of all creation yeah. that God made us. God loved us. Yeah. We made the mistake of sinning. Wow. And yet he came down to die for us. Now he demands our total commitment by complete surrender yeah. that we would be his disciples yeah. and that through the death, prayer, and resurrection of his son, he would save us and take us to heaven. Yeah. Come on, God. That's the truth. Yeah. Come on. And we know that. Yeah. We live that. And we want to share that truth with the world. Yeah. Wow. Come on. Do you understand? Like, like when someone, when a professor or a CEO sits down between you and them and if there's a Bible open, you know the truth. Right. They're in your world, in your realm. Yeah. Right. You. Yeah. That's how powerful you are yeah. mm. when you know the truth of the universe, God's word. Yeah. Yeah. You know, another one is that when we fear God and when we know the Bible, Pain is no longer meaningless. That's so true. Come on. You know, as human beings, we, we typically, we try to spend our lives avoiding what? Pain. We try and, ah, anything that hurts, mentally, physically, emotionally, we try and avoid it at all costs. And we try and maximize what's comfortable, what feels good, and just avoid the hard things. Then we wonder why. Why in life things never change? Because you're you're too comfortable. Mm. Wow. Why am I going through this hardship? There's a lesson. Mm. Mm. That's so. You see, Romans chapter five, verse four, it's right down. It says, suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. So if you have hard things in your life and it's like, oh, it's so painful, there must not be a God. No, 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 no. Because there's pain in your life, there is God. Yeah. He's trying to grow your character yeah. so you can have hope. You know, I had a dear brother ask him, I know Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, to prosper you, not to harm you, but I feel like I got a lot of harm. Mm. Well, the scripture says then to give you hope and a future. But in Jeremiah 29, if God says he's going to give you hope, now we connect that with Romans chapter 5. Wow. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, wow. character, and wow. character. Come on. Hope! There we go. You see, the suffering we go through does not make Jeremiah 29 11 wrong. Right. That's awesome. It means that the pain has a purpose wow. and will end up with hope if we persevere. Right. If we learn the lessons from the pain. Wow. Come on, bro. Now, without God, pain just. Makes us discouraged. Yeah. I've had a hard life. I'm a nobody. Pain makes us insecure. I was abused growing up, and so I'm only going to be what my abusers told me. And all of a sudden, pain doesn't mean anything. Pain takes us out. So, pain is going to come in this life, yep. whether you follow God or not. That's true. <laughs> That's true. But having a knowledge of God and fearing God. Pain makes sense now. That's yeah. true. Pain has a purpose. Without God, pain makes us feel hopeless. Yeah. That's true. That's true. 
fearing God gives us knowledge of these things. Wow. Fearing God allows us to see our life through the scriptures, through God's word, according to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. You know, that would be a wise person is to have that knowledge. Proverbs 1, 7, the second half says, But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Fools can know a lot. It doesn't say fools don't have knowledge. Fools can actually know a lot. Know a lot. The foolish thing is, is when we think we know so much that we cannot be instructed. Yeah. We gotta ask the question: What is what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to put into practice what you know to get a result that helps others. That's wisdom. Is applying what you know to live a wise life. To be wise in your ways. Yeah. So foolish people can know a bunch of stuff and then not do it. <laughs> right? What's foolish is to despise wisdom and instruction. You know, how do we live out what we know? I think one of the things that we can grow in is getting advice for each stage of life that we're in. Let me give you an example. Come on, bro. I, got, I became a disciple, I got baptized in my third year of college. So I had to change my ways, learn how to follow God, change who I hang out with, change the things I did on the weekend, a lot of sin, a lot of drinking, just terrible stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm a disciple, man of God, woo! And then one day, I wanted to date and get married. I met my wife. Dated. We got married. We're still dating. Woo! But here's the problem. <laughs> here's the problem. When I was, you know, in the, engaged and getting married, we got married. How much did I know about being a husband? Uh, this much. This is how I knew about being a husband. But very sadly, in my foolishness, you know what my mindset was? Ah, oh, yeah, I'm a disciple. I know what I'm doing. I had spent time reading books about marriage. First, the Bible. And then second, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Uh, you know, I just started, I wanted to learn how to, how to it's a good book. Uh, Boundaries of Marriage, a great book. So I said, I had all this knowledge, all this information about what it's like to be married. And guess how I was as a husband the first few years. Instead of being wise and taking instruction, instead of going to the spiritual men in my life who had our disciples who've been following God and they've been married for 10, 15, 20 years. They had so much wisdom on how to be a good husband and they were going to point me back to the Bible. But I thought what? I don't even know what I'm doing. You see, when you woke up today, you've never been here before. That's a disciple. Wow. I've been a, a Christian, a disciple for, let's see, October 25th, October, November, December, January. I've been a disciple for eight years, three months, two weeks, and five days, or whatever the number is. And you know what? I've never been here today as a disciple. Yeah. I never followed God the way I need to today, because it's new. Yeah. Come on, bro. I've got to remain. We must remain students. Yeah. Yes. Someone who fears God is like, hey, I, I want to keep learning the Bible and how to live it out. Uh, sure, you might have knowledge. Sure, you might have known this or that. You learned a thing or two being a Christian. Awesome. Stay a student. Don't be foolish. You know, we all need to find the areas in our life where we're not willing to take instruct instruction. Where we lose the fear of God. And we're like, God, you cannot tell me what to do here. For some of us, it might be in our time management, in our schedule. It might be in our finances. For some of us, it might be in our health and fitness. Don't tell me what to eat. Don't tell me I need to exercise. Isn't that shallow? No. The Bible talks about how we look outside. It's super important. Where are the areas where you, we turn to foolishness? You know... I think about it like this. What if a lot of people are going to walk through this door today? First, the tiger. But second, second, what if LeBron James or Cristiano Ronaldo walked into the room and they said, I would immediately be like, oh, this is nice. 
You didn't have a seat because I'm talking about God. But yeah. let's say that, like, you know, let's say I was like, all right, what do you guys say? You're making an announcement. And LeBron James or Ronaldo was like, hey, just want everyone to know, we're giving free lessons in basketball and in soccer. Ooh. Right after church and all week. How many of you would, would think that those guys know what they're doing? That they can actually help you get good at basketball or soccer? I would. How many of you would like sign up? Raise your hand. Yeah, of course, all the brothers and them. <laughs> so, so let me help. You. What if Beyonce Knowles walked in and was like, "I'm giving free classes on singing and dancing." How many of you would sign up? I would sign up. Or, or, or what if, what if the CEO of Amazon, a bajillionaire, Jeff Bezos, walks in and is like. I'm going to teach you how to start your own business and make money. I mean, the guy owns Amazon, right? They got grocery stores, pharmacies. You know, Amazon started its own airline. Like, this guy needs to come in, offer free lessons. So we'd be like, oh, my God, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. So God. Uh, God. Wow. The creator of the universe <laughs> every day has a free lesson. Wow. He can teach you. Come on, bro. He can help you. On, bro. Why? If it's Jeff Bezos or LeBron James or Beyonce, we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's God, we don't have the same humility, the same fear of God to learn. What he wants for us. Wow. Just shows we have a higher respect yeah. for the LeBron James and the Beyonce of the world than we do God. Wow. Come on, bro. Are we wise wow. or foolish? Wow. It is time to humble ourselves. Ourselves out of respect and reverence for God. We must make every effort, my brothers and sisters, to put into practice what we learn from the Bible, especially if you're a disciple in the church and you have a mentor, if you have a D time every week, and there's a Bible study and a call to action, something to change, you should do it. If you're not having a D time with scriptures and then what to change, you ask for it. Ask for it, go get it. You know, I really wanna challenge us. You know, every day as a church, I know we, we all read the Bible and pray for each and every one of us to get close to God. And we can read the Bible and pray, pour out our heart and soul to God in prayer. I understand something in the passage of scripture. Maybe we get the historical context and the cultural context and we break down a passage and we're like, wow, we learn. But I want to challenge us in our quiet times this week, at the end of your quiet time, what does God want me to do? Mm -hmm. If we don't come out of our quiet times changed, meaning doing something different, yeah. then we connected with God in the sense of like, oh, God, I learned about you. Well, we learned about God, but God, you know what he learned about us? We don't want to change. Mm. Mm. We'd rather take Whoa. the foolish path. Come on, bro. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Wow. we got to fear God every day by changing after we read our Bible and pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. My second point. Are we winning or sinning? Ooh. My second point. Are we winning or sinning? Ooh. Let's go over here. Exodus chapter 20. Now. Looking at the topic of the fear of the Lord. So we're going to study that out in, in different places of scripture. We've got to get the context, right? The context in the book of Exodus is that this guy Moses has led God's people out of slavery, out of Egypt. God worked through Moses. He did the ten plagues, right? And he got the people to be free. Right. They leave Egypt, and they go to the Red Sea, and they turn around, and Pharaoh's army is chasing them. They're like, come back to slavery. So they're like, oh, what do we do? God does arguably the greatest miracle through Moses. Moses puts his staff in the sea. The Red Sea parts, and two million men, women, and children cross through the Red Sea. And when the Egyptian army tries to follow them through, the waters of the Red Sea wash them away. Now, this is a physical thing that really happened, but it's spiritual for us. 
We're God's people. We were trapped in slavery and sin. Someone came to us with the Bible, the teachings of Jesus. They set us free from our sin. And the waters of baptism, our sins are washed away just like those Egyptians. Now, what about after the waters? What about after the water? Well, what would he expect? That person would not have to live by the Bible. So, right after the Israelites cross through the Red Sea, the first thing God does, he comes down on Mount Sinai and guess what he gives them? His word, the commands, how to follow him. Now, arguably, the most famous of those commands we today know as the Ten Commandments. So Exodus chapter 20 is where we find the Ten Commandments. Right after God gives his people the Ten Commandments, let's see what happens. Come on, bro. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. Now, God is speaking, and now we're, we're getting the point of view of all of the people. When the people saw the thunder, how do you even see thunder? Did you know you hear thunder? When people saw the thunder and the lightning, and they heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, the people trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance. The people said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you, so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sin. Are we winning or sin? So God gives the Ten Commandments. The people hear his voice. They say it's loud as thunder. His presence is flashing like lightning. They're so scared. They're like, God, just don't say anything. They don't, we'll die. You know, you always have that person who's like, well, if God's real, how come he doesn't like show himself? Dude, right. you would, we would die on the spot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we understand. Like, hi, I'm God. <laughs> they all just drop the keys. That's out. He wouldn't kill us because he's mad. It's his nature. Yeah. Think about the sun. Think about the sun. The sun, the sun, it, it literally, we get vitamin D from the sun. It grows our crops. Without the sun, there's no water cycle, evaporation, condensation, precipitation. So we don't have water without the sun. Trees don't grow to get our oxygen. Like the sun gives life. And God gives life, but you know, the sun. Now, we're all like, yay, the sun is so good. Okay, walk outside and stare at the sun for five minutes. Oh. What'll happen? What if you just, no sunscreen to stand in the sun? Oh. What if you, what if you got in the spaceship and just flew straight at the sun? Would uh, we even make it? No. We'd all die. Now, is the sun like evil and wicked and trying to hurt us? No. The sun is so powerful. So awesome, the sun, that we have to be in a right relationship. We have to be in a right relationship with the sun. We have to be in the right position where it gives us what we need, lights and everything good. But we can't be in a wrong relationship where it kills. Yeah. That's similar to God. Mm. God gives everything we need. But if we stay in a wrong relationship with him, yeah, we'll be killed. Mm. All right. We understand? Yeah. Yep. Great. Now, verse 20, if we put our thinking caps on, we're going to see a little bit of what seems at first a contradiction. Moses tells the people, do not be afraid. But then look at the end. He goes, the fear of God will be with you. So what is it? Do I have to be afraid of fear of God? Or do I not be afraid? He's saying both things here. Moses? <laughs> Mo. <laughs> Mo. The people didn't have to be afraid of God's word. God's word would actually help them be in a right relationship. But the fear of God, the fear of his presence, the fear of his majesty, they should be afraid. It's the type of fear if the tiger walked in. It's dangerous and it's a threat. We should be afraid. We should actually be afraid of God. What a, what a well, Nate, that's a cool opinion, you know. But like, can you explain that more? Okay. Jesus said it. 
Let's go over here at Luke 12. Come on, bro. Luke 12. Luke 12. The fear of God will keep us from sin. What type of fear? God is dangerous and a threat. Come on, Nate. Luke 12. Pick it right here in verse 1. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to who? This is for disciples. Come on. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. Which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. There is nothing hidden that will not be made known. Mm. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. What you have whispered in the ear, in the inner room, will be proclaimed from the roofs. Roofs. I tell you, my friends. He's a, he's a friend here. I tell you, my friends. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Mm. And after that, can do no more. But I will show you who you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Ooh. Yes, I tell you. Fear him. Wow. Come on. Wow. Wow. Yeah. wow. I didn't write it. I did the word Jesus. Jesus has thousands of people come. And his disciples are there. And this is the message that he chooses to preach. He says, hey, there's people who play religious, in this case, the Pharisees. People who hold positions of power. And they're not really following the Bible. They're fakes. They're actors. Hypo hypocrite means actors. And they do stuff that hurts God's people, and they do it in the dark. They do it in the light. They conceal it. They try and hide it. And Jesus says, it's all going to be revealed. Now, when we get hurt by people in the church... When we get hurt by people in the church, our temptation is to turn to sin. Mm. But Jesus says, at that point, you've lost the fear of God. Because right after he talks about the Pharisees and all that stuff, he goes, fear God, because he can throw you into hell. Fear God, because he can throw you into hell. Wow. my mind. You think the tiger was scared? No. The tiger could only kill your body. Only. It's, 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 it's the person in the afterlife who has the authority that we got to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, bro. Come on, bro. Now, perhaps you're here this morning and you're like, well, I'm a baptized disciple of Jesus Christ. Great. Keep it that way. <laughs> because after you die, if you're, if you're still that, then guess what? We get to go to heaven. Come on. That fear will have kept us from sinning while we're here on earth. And we can go to heaven. If you're not, Maybe you're studying the Bible. Maybe you're learning new stuff about the Bible you never knew before. And you're struggling to accept it. Fear God. Just be humble. Accept the scriptures. Get baptized. Or go to hell. It's up to you. God is only going to put you where you want to be. He takes no joy. He takes no pleasure. There's nothing about God that is, if you read in a Revelation, it says God created hell for the devil and his angels. Yeah. God's heart and intention for hell was for Satan, who rebelled against God, who lost the spirit of God, and for his, the angels who followed him. That's, God did not make hell for us. But God will put people there who are already going there if they don't repent, if they don't change, if they don't let the fear of God keep them from sinning. You know, I got to share a story, very sad. My wife and some of the girls in the church, they had a Bible study just yesterday. And they go into the conference room. We have a little conference room in our apartment complex. And when they walk in, there's a group of girls already studying the Bible. They're already there. So I appreciate you, Sister Victoria. She takes the opportunity to share her faith. Come on. Come on, Come on. <laughs> oh yeah, we, we go we go to a Catholic church and, and you know yeah Bi we're just here for a Bible study that like Dad Bible's open on the table. 
So they, my wife and Victoria do the Bible study. They didn't tell me what, what they were doing, but my wife did tell me the Bible study went an hour and a half. But the whole time of that Bible study, they can hear the other girls talking. You know, Bible's open on the table. One girl is talking about what she does with her boyfriend. And one time her, fr her boyfriend's friend came in and then what she did with both of them together. Wow. They're talking about getting drunk, partying, the next opportunity to meet a guy and do things. Hour and a half, the conversation goes on and on and on. And one of the girls even had the guts. Well, yeah, I haven't gone all the way. So me and God are still good. He understands. Oh, no. That's crazy. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm not saying that any of us in this room are better than them. We don't look down on them. It's not like we're better than you. No, 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 no. My heart, as my wife was telling me the story, my heart hurt. It, it broke. I was like, they're so lost. They're so in a sense, clueless. They're being hurt and taken advantage of by man after man after man. And then it's gonna be such a shock for them on that day when they have to answer to God. Look at that God, I did that Bible study in the conference room, God. I showed up at Catholic church or any church every day, God. Like, what do you mean? Uh, 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 you know, he says, depart from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. My heart hurts that that's the words they're gonna hear. Because there's no fear of God. Right. And the hope, the hope for them is to be Lord. It's you and me to, to reach out to them because we care, because we love them. Because yeah. we fear God. We want to help other people. Yeah. Come on. That's the hope. We're not better than anyone, man. We're ex sinners yeah. trying to help sinners. And sometimes we say, but we should have a heart that we ourselves are not going to save. If that's not the heart, well, then the sinning is winning. Wow. Mm. You know, I think of the hardest thing to do as a disciple is to keep the level of seriousness towards your sin over time. Do you remember when you first studied the Bible, whether it was last week or for me eight years ago, and you first read biblically like what sin is, right? You know, like Galatians five nineteen, like run through the list, and Second Timothy three, and you're like, and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I didn't know that was sin. Oh my gosh, wow, that's in the Bible. Oh my gosh, wow. And you, you took it serious. Like, oh, now that I know, oh, I'm gonna change, which is good. The, the strength to that is we do change. I, I personally stopped womanizing. I stopped drinking. I stopped getting high. I had to forgive my mom, who I had a lot of hatred towards. Guys, I'm a, I was a mess. A lot. I had to change. Because the Bible showed me what God saw right and wrong. Come on, Dave. The thing is, after you make those changes, the more obvious changes, I stopped cursing. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. I stopped. The hard part, then, is still taking the other changes the other sins serious mm. yeah. it's always that third scripture right James 4 17 anyone who knows the good they should do but doesn't do it sin. right yeah. that's the hard ones like I don't always want to share my faith I don't mm. always want to go to church but the good I should do yeah. and that fear of God keeps me from what there. from there. sinning Come on. Yeah. I really want to. I really want to admonish the church. I really do want to correct the church. As a group, our biggest shortcoming is probably our weekly gifts. Mm. It's probably our contribution. Every week, there's about 18 to 20 people who come. We come here. We sing our songs. We pray. We get a communion mission. We we talk in the fellowship. Hey, bro. Hey, sis. I love you. You're awesome. <laughs> We're here for God. And we walk right out those doors, and we don't worship God in our finances. Wow. We don't, they, people just don't get it. And I'm not talking about like one time. I, I get a list every week. People who haven't given for three weeks. Mm. Some four or five weeks. 
These are me for a whole month. It was not important to worship God in our diet. Wow. The good we ought to do, but don't do, is what? Well, Nate, but I, I lost my job or I'm in financial hardship. Totally understandable. Deuteronomy 16, 16. Never show up before God empty-handed. Mm. Get one dollar. Come on. Don't want to show up before God empty-handed. And then ask for help. Yeah. If you're in financial hardship, you need groceries, you need to write a word, a little help with rent, we'll give you money. Yeah. I'll help you. We'll help you. Your family. Come on, bro. But for someone to come in here and leave without giving to God, it's a lack of a fear of God. Come on, bro. We gotta, we gotta repent. We gotta change in this area. Why? Why? Because God wants to do so much more with us. When we pay our contribution, we can afford to meet in this room. It costs money. We can put on interns. We can have more baptisms. God can work through his people yeah. when there's the means to do it. Yeah. The main thing about Javier getting baptized. Oh, yeah. 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 I just got yeah. Adrian, he just got baptized. Oh, yeah. 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 But in my mind and heart, I'm like, what if there was another Adrian? Yeah. Another Javier? Yeah. Another Olivia who's come oh, over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sisters, because we honor God with our money, yeah. we're able to put on interns, we're able to pay people to, to share their faith more. Come on. Man, we, we built this room. Yeah. Then we couldn't meet here. Then we have to meet in a bigger room, which costs what? More money. We'll have more people who can pay the customer more money, more room, more people, more disciples, more baptisms, more. We can do more for God. Yeah. Come on. Because God wants to do more through us. Yeah. It. We honor him in our giving. Come on, bro. Come on. My last point, and we'll close out right here. Come on, Nate. Come on, bro. It's not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> State it, bro. We are persuaded to persuade others. We are persuaded to persuade others. We'll close out right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I think. I think we really got to understand this scripture. It's so important. Sometimes we get stuck in the little day-to-day -day details, and we can forget the big picture. This is like one of those big picture scriptures. Kind of gives us the big picture, the ultimate purpose. Second Corinthians chapter five. We'll pick up right here, in verse one. It says, "For we know, and I hope that we know today." For we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God. Wow. An eternal house in heaven. Wow. Not built by human hand. Meanwhile, so before we get to that house, meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, meaning our physical bodies, we groan because we are burdened. We do not wish to be unclothed, but we wish to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. That is what is mortal, our bodies, may be swallowed up by life. Now, the one who's made us, fashioned us for this very purpose is God. He has given us a spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we're always confident. And know that as long as we are at home in this body, we're away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say. And we would prefer to be away from this body and at home with the Lord. Mm. So we make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due. What is due to us for the things that are done in the body. Whether good or bad. Alright, stop right there. Paul paints this picture. We have physical bodies. We may or may not like them. At the end of the day, we don't want to be in this body, in this tent. Right. We want our bodies to be clothed with Christ. We want a heavenly body where we get to go up to heaven. Yeah, bro. How are we going to get there? He says, well, you live a life to please God. Yeah. Wow. 
And why would we want to please God? Well, because we are going to stand before the judgment seat and he's going to judge us for the things we did, good or bad. This is cool because it means he cares about our decisions. Our decisions matter to him. Some of us think of the word judge as like, that's a bad word. No, no, judge is good. Because if we did good, then what's the judgment? Good judgment. What's well, a good thing. Right? And right after he says that, he goes, we're going to stand for God. We're going to get judged. He says this last thing right here, verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. And what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is plain to your conscience. You see, Paul says if we actually believe in a death, if we actually believe that all of our bodies resurrect, we move into eternity, we get judged by God, and we go to heaven or hell for us, heaven. If we actually believe that that's actually true, we're going to persuade others. Wow. It says the fear of God will help you persuade others. Like, think about it. Like, we got to persuade everyone out there. This is the truth. Fear God and follow Him. Go to heaven. That's what we got to persuade people. There's a, a famous story. There's a magician, Penn Fraser Gillette, French magician. But he does over 300 shows every year in Las Vegas. Very famous magician. He's been on various talk shows and podcasts, and he's an atheist. He's a very vocal, proclaimed atheist. And one day he goes on a podcast, and Penn Fraser Gillette, he shared this. He shared, I was walking out of my hotel in Las Vegas, and a man attempted to proselyze me. Proselyze means to share your faith and try and convert. That's what it means, proselyze. Wow. And he goes, I was very thankful for the man. Because if you believe that there is a heaven and hell, don't you think it's worth telling someone about it? Yeah. If not, how much do you have to hate them? Mm. To believe that everlasting life is possible and to not tell people. It surprises me because most Christians are filled with hatred. Wow. <laughs> this is an atheist. Wow. He doesn't accept, subscribe, or believe there is heaven and hell. But he's actually humble enough to realize other people believe that. And he said he wishes more people would show their faith. Wow. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I love it. You took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. I want to challenge us to persuade others. Yeah. I want to challenge each and every one of us to share our faith every day this week. Yeah. Oh, but I'm married, but I have kids. But I, me too. Share on social media. Social media, you have to share. Share at the store. Yeah. I really want to lift up Ruthie and Darian. Yeah. Yeah. They've done a great job. And here's the thing, I, I'm aware of it. They've done a great job pushing uh, the singles ministry. Yeah. I even hear, like, oh my God, we're doing so much. This is, should be the baseline. Yeah. Wow. Darian was telling me, we went to Target and we shared our faith. Wow. Bro, that's awesome. He goes, some of, the, some of the disciples, they got toilet paper. They got trash bags. They got clean supplies for the house. I'm like, that's awesome. Now imagine if we just did that all the time. Wow. Right. Share at the gym. How many of you go grocery shop? Share at the grocery shop. <laughs> There's never an excuse to not open our mouth yeah. and share our faith with those lost. Share your kids' soccer game. I don't care. Share your faith. My brothers and sisters, let's have a healthy fear of God. And uh, it's an honor to present to you two people who have a fear of God. They've come to the be baptized. Let's go. Olivia and Chris. Wow.